Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hey. Uh, my name is Mike Petrilli. I'm the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute and also a visiting fellow here at the Hoover Institution. And thank you for coming out in person to, to be here in person in real life to join us. This is the first in-person event that Fordham has hosted since the pandemic. Uh, and it's, it's great to be in person. And it's also a challenge to know how to get people in Washington, D.C to not only come to an event, but first we gotta get them to come downtown, <laughs> which as everybody knows has been uh, something the city is still struggling. So uh, we appreciate you being here. Those of you that are watching uh, online and the recorded video, greetings to you as well. Uh, we have a great program for you today with some fantastic speakers and it's tackling one of the most important, but often overlooked issues in American education. Uh, and that is how we can widen and diversify the pipeline of American students prepared to do advanced level work. Now, this issue is arguably even more important today now that we are living in the post-affirmative action world. If we care about keeping our college campuses and professions and elite institutions diverse, and we should, uh, and if we wanna make sure that we are helping all of our young people live up to their full academic potential, we've gotta do a much better job identifying all, all students. Oh, there we go. Okay, now okay. the speaker's working. Uh, let me say that again. Uh, we, we've got to do a much better job identifying all students, including black, Hispanic, and low-income students, with great academic potential and give them the opportunity to develop that potential. And it's way too late to start in 12th grade. It's way too late to start in high school. We've got to start in kindergarten if we're going to be successful. That is one of the key arguments of a recent report from the National Working Group on Advanced Education, which those of us in this room were very proud of had to be. Uh, uh, this is great. There's a young video yeah. having in person issues. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, we're going to just project. Uh, the working group was made up of scholars, practitioners, policymakers, and advocates from the left, right, and center. And as you may notice, uh, this city and this country are rather polarized these days. You don't see a lot of groups and people from the left, right, and center. Uh, but this group came together with a, a lot of common ground around a mission of making sure that we do not overlook all the great talent that is out there in our country. So if you go and you look at this report that we put out in the National Working Group on Advanced Education, we've got 36 recommendations, uh, which you can dig into in the report. But, but really, in a nutshell, what we were saying is that when it comes to things like gifted and talented programs, achievement grouping, advanced courses in middle school and high school, uh, the plea was to mend it, not end it. And in fact, to extend it to many more students uh, who could be prepared and willing to do the hard work it takes to achieve at an advanced level. Uh, now, we're here to talk about another new report from Fordham that is on a similar topic, this one talking about excellence gaps in American education. Now, excellence gaps are simply achievement gaps where they focus on the advanced level of achievement. And like the regular achievement gap that we often talk about, sadly, we see significant gaps both by race and by socioeconomic status. Uh, this report that we're gonna discuss today is one of the first to examine those two issues together, as well as to examine how excellence gaps have changed over the past 20 years. Now, though not the focus of today's event, I should say that this is quite similar to a new analysis that you might have seen in the New York Times the other day. Uh, this one from Raj Chetty and his colleagues at Harvard's Opportunity Insights. What they did is they looked at SAT scores and how they break down by various income groups. Okay, sorry, Laura, for the New York Times joining, but we'll talk to me. Uh, so this is from the article, and what they're showing here, as it says, it says the percent of SAT test takers who scored 1,300 or higher by income. Okay. And it's showing the top 0.1%, the top 1%, and then 20, 40, 60, and so on. Uh, and obviously what you can see here are massive differences uh, by income group and who's scoring at this very high level. Now, the line 1,300 uh, on the SAT, or as they say, a 29 in the ACT, this is a level that uh, will get you into most of America's selective colleges. Maybe not the tippity-tippity top ones like the Ivy League, uh, but certainly your flagship state universities uh, and most selective private institutions, okay? And we see these huge, uh, these huge gaps by income. I, you notice over there uh, for the lowest income kids, but frankly also the next uh, quintile and even the quintile for that very 
few kids scoring at this level. Now, the New York Times article uh, in its upshot section did a very nice job reporting on the study. And it examined all the various reasons why we see these kinds of gaps. It discussed the effects of poverty, the extraordinary resources that affluent parents are pouring into parenting and tutoring and summer programming and all the rest. Uh, the fact that most of these gaps are apparent already when students enter school as kindergartners, uh, and also the various in-school factors that might be at play, including all the typical ones that we talk about, school spending and segregation. Uh, but what I found interesting was that the article really didn't focus at all on high achieving students. In other words, uh, the, the article was about you know, the achievement gap rather than about the excellence gap. Uh, there wasn't any specific focus on the students who were most likely to be able to go on and score at these high levels on a test like the ACE and T. Because uh, you know, if you notice, as high as these bars are for the top 0.1% or the top 1% or even the top 20%, it's still the case that the vast majority of even those very affluent kids are not scoring at that high level. I mean, the kids who can score at 1,300 are very special. Uh, and frankly, we have a pretty good sense of who those kids are likely to be. I mean, we can see in the early grades how kids are doing on, on achievement tests, and we can predict with you know, decent uh, accuracy which kids are gonna have a shot at being in the range of this, right? Uh, now, whereas the affluent kids who come into school that have the potential to score at these kinds of levels, these affluent kids, what we know from other research is that they are quite likely to go to elementary schools and gifted and talented programs, uh, to schools that allow them to do above grade level work, okay? So for example, where they maybe get to do uh, fourth grade level math even though they're still in third grade. They go to middle schools and high schools where there's lots of advanced courses where they can again do above grade level work with other advanced peers, right? Uh, and, and all of this helps them to take that potential that we maybe saw when they were little and get to the point where when they're in 12th grade they're getting these kinds of results, right? Meanwhile, uh, what we know from several studies from Fordham and others is that many of the low income kids uh, who start out with a lot of potential we're much less likely to get to go to schools, get to in-town to programs. They just aren't there. The high poverty schools don't have them, right? Uh, less likely to do above grade level work, right? These are schools that maybe say, we're not gonna do any kind of achievement grouping. Uh, in fact, because the high poverty schools tend to have so many kids who tend to be very low achieving, it's much more likely that in those high poverty schools, the teachers are targeting their instruction at a relatively low level. So those high achieving kids, not only are they not gonna get to it and to accelerate, they're probably spending a lot of time with instruction that's way, way below their level. And the same thing can happen in middle school and high school. Not as many advanced courses, not as many opportunities for that. In fact, places where maybe they've said, hey, because of equity, we're, in fact, we're going to, quote, detrack. We see that all the time, right? Uh, and that means that those low-income kids don't have access to advanced coursework. We have not seen that kind of detracking take place as much in those affluent communities. So my argument would be, wow, you're saying 2.4% of the poorest kids scoring at that level. That number, I believe, could be and should be much, much higher. And if we went 12 years earlier and looked at the kids when they are in kindergarten, and you said, which, how many kids had the potential to score at high levels, it would be much higher than 2.4. Now look, it may not be as high as what you see for the affluent kids because of all the issues that the article, the New York Times article raised, I mean, poverty, it's for real, the parenting issues, all of that stuff matters. But the question is, are our schools doing all they can to make sure that low income and working class and even middle class kids who show up with a lot of academic potential have the same opportunities to fulfill that potential as the more uh, affluent kids? Uh, and I would argue that, yeah, it's pretty obvious that it's not. You know, our, our Friends of Education Trust, represented today by Allison, you know, they've often said over the years that we take the kids who need the most and we give them the least. Right, and, and that, that I think is what's happening for high achieving kids too. So I hope as we dig into these questions, into the study that we're gonna talk about, uh, we can talk about how we extend opportunities for advanced education to many more kids, especially those from disadvantaged and underrepresented groups. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, we're gonna start with a presentation by my colleague, Meredith Coffey, who is one of the co-authors of the new report on excellence gaps. Uh, she'll present his findings. And then we've got a fantastic panel moderated by Laura Meckler of the Washington Post. Uh, Laura will introduce our panel when we get to that part of the program. But let me first just say a bit about Meredith and about Laura. So Meredith 
is a research associate at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute and a graduate student in education policy at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, before coming to Fordham, Meredith taught high school English at public schools in New York City and in Fairfax County, Virginia. And Laura is the national education writer for the Washington Post, where she covers education across the country as well as federal education policy politics. She came to the Post from the Wall Street Journal, where she covered presidential politics, the White House, um, changing demographics, immigration, and health care. Perhaps most importantly, she is the author of a new book, uh, right here, yes, uh, Dreamtown, Shaker Heights, and the Quest for Racial Equity. Uh, and uh, the issue of excellence gaps is definitely a major theme that is in it, this book, and I hope that uh, we get to talk about it and hear about that as well. So uh, first, Meredith, take it away. We got to get here. Yeah, we got to I mean, I can probably, is my mic working? Well, yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, it's just a little bit. I can project, that'll be good. And maybe I'll just stand yeah. over here so I can start. Should I start? Perfect. All right, thank y'all so much for being here today. Thanks to Mike for his uh, remarks. Thanks to Abigail and Victoria for putting this event together. Um, and to all of y'all for being here. So I'm gonna give a brief overview of the findings of the report that, as Mike mentioned, I co-authored with my colleague Adam Tyner, who's gonna be here today, um, Excellence Gaps by Race and Socioeconomic Status. Uh, so I'll give you a very brief overview of the study, and then we'll talk about the findings in two groups. Um, first, uh, the finding is about the intersection of uh, race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status and excellence gaps. Those are our more static findings. Um, and then the second set of findings um, being excellence gaps over time, over the past 20 years and since the COVID-19 pandemic, how have those excellence gaps um, evolved over time? Um, so hopefully you were able to grab a partial copy of the study. Thanks to my colleague, Abigail, had those printed out. If not, you will grab one uh, in a little bit. We had three main research questions. Um, the first being, to what extent can racial and ethnic excellence gaps be explained by socioeconomic status? So most of the previous scholarship on excellence gaps has either focused on racial and ethnic excellence gaps or socioeconomic excellence gaps, but not the two of them at the same time. So in other words, if, we're, if we account for socioeconomic status, are we still going to see uh, those racial and ethnic excellence gaps? Uh, the secondly, a different way to look at the same question, would it help if it came up? Um, if we are looking at racial and ethnic groups within the same socioeconomic groups, are we still seeing excellence gaps? So for example, if we are looking at the most socioeconomically advantaged students, are we still seeing disparities in performance between Asian American and Hispanic students? Uh, and then our third research question, again, being how those gaps have shifted over time. So, so that you know the terms that we're talking about for our variables for race and ethnicity, I should say that all of our data come from the NAEP Data Explorer. So all of those data collected through the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Um, we focus on these four racial and ethnic groups, Asian American Pacific Islands are black, Hispanic, and white. Um, unfortunately, there's some groups we had to leave out of the analysis due to lack of statistical significance. Um, and obviously, I should say these groups are like not monolithic, right? There's a lot of nuance and complexity within each of these groups, but these are the data we have to make the picture uh, that we can. And for our socioeconomic status, of course, there are many variables we could have used. We considered the student's mother's highest level of education, the student's estimate of the number of books in their home, and um, how perhaps most commonly used, whether or not the student is qualified for free or reduced price lunch, um, for reasons that I'd be happy to discuss more at length later if you were interested. Um, but we ended up going with mother's highest level of education, who was the best fit for our study. So when I refer to socioeconomic groups or status within this presentation for most of the report, that's the, the socioeconomic variable that I'm referring to. Uh, and then finally, the data point that, of course, was most of interest to us was advanced performance. So on the NAEP, which are the students performing at that top tier, at that top level? And so we looked at data for eighth graders in both reading and math going from 2003 to 2022 and just looking at what percentage of each demographic group 
reach that advanced level on the NAEP, again, in both reading and math. Um, and something to flag for our static findings, we average. We didn't just take the last year of the NAEP, because that was obviously after the pandemic, it may or may not have really been representative, but we wanted to account for that. Um, so we averaged the last three um, assessment um, data from the last three assessments. Uh, so our first set of findings um, on the intersection of race and socioeconomic status and excellence gaps, our first finding was essentially within socioeconomic groups, we are still seeing racial and ethnic excellence gaps. So put differently, even if we are accounting for socioeconomic status, there are still disparities in the rates of advanced performance between the current racial and ethnic groups. Um, so to help you visualize this, I don't know how easily y'all can see from the back, um, but we've got math on the left, reading on the right, and you can see each cluster of bars is a socioeconomic group, and each bar represents a different racial and ethnic group, and you can see those bars are different lengths. And so you are seeing different percentages of those groups scoring at the advanced rate. Uh, two other things I'll flag, you can see the disparities are somewhat larger in math than in reading. Um, and you can see still just the same, that they're fairly similar patterns. So in all the groups you are seeing, more mother's education in general. None. There's a higher percentage of students achieving advance. Um, and then there's a similar pattern where in each of these cases, Asian American Pacific Islander students have the highest rate of advanced achievement, followed by white students, followed by Hispanic students, followed by black students. Being either without exception or almost without exception. Um, our second finding, and one that I personally found to be among the more surprising, is that racial and ethnic excellence gaps actually get larger the higher the SES group is. So in other words, among if you look at all the students whose mothers graduated from college, there is a larger gap there between, for example, Asian American Pacific Islander student average rates of advanced achievement um, and those for Hispanic students. So the more socioeconomically advantaged those students are, the bigger the gap is. So to show you what I mean, um, let me give you a minute. Um, these are results for reading. And so what you are seeing, I'm just gonna point a little bit here. So you're seeing the percentage point difference in the advanced rate. So to give you an example, can you see this? Like, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, so these clusters of bars are comparing the rates of advanced achievement among different uh, racial and ethnic groups within the same socioeconomic group. So for example, here, this is supposed to be green, I don't know if it's coming across as green, but you're looking at this bar. If you look at AAPI students and black students, all of whose mothers have no high school diploma, then you're gonna see a four percentage point difference in the rate of advanced achievement. So you're seeing 4% more AAPI students whose mothers have no high school diploma achieve advanced compared to black students whose mothers have no high school diploma. So that's not an insignificant difference, but it's not fast. However, as socioeconomic status goes up, you can see that that gap gets wider. So when you compare the rates of advanced achievement for AAPI students whose mothers graduated college, that is almost a 15, per point, 15 percentage point difference compared to black students whose mothers graduate in college. So that is obviously a much larger gap. And you can see, although the other clusters have smaller gaps, they still follow that same pattern. So every time, it's like in each of these cases, as socioeconomic status goes up, that gap gets larger. And you can see, this is for reading, and it's the same pattern for now as well. Um, our third finding, which might not seem like it follows from the first two, but I promise I will explain, is that socioeconomic status still actually has a similar effect size on all these racial and ethnic groups. Um, so here is what I mean by that. Please bear with me, I promise. So you'll see on the left is math, on the right is reading. Don't look at reading right now. Look at it later, I'll tell you when. Um, but we're gonna look at math. And what you are seeing is each of these groups represents uh, racial, either be bars, I should say, represents a racial or ethnic group compared to the rate of advanced achievement for the highest 
SES group of that same racial and ethnic group. Let me illustrate by example. So if we're looking at some college here for the math results, you can see that all these bars are right around the point five. So what that means is for each of these racial and ethnic groups, those whose mothers attended some college, that group's rate of advanced achievement is about half the rates of their same racial ethnic counterparts whose mothers attended and graduated college. So for example, for AEPI students, if, they, if their mothers attended some college, they achieved advance at about half the rate of those whose mothers graduated college, a little more than half. Um, and the same ratio-wise is more or less true for all of the racial and ethnic groups. Um, it's a little more, there's a little more disparities with the lower SES uh, groups, but it's still pretty similar. You see those bars are similar heights. You can see for a minute now, looking over to reading, you can look at reading now. Um, if you look at AEPI, Hispanic, and white students, you see a similar pattern. Those bars are still a somewhat similar height. So again, you're seeing for reading, it's a little bit over 50% um, for the some college group. Um, the rate at which they are achieving advance compared to, imagine that dotted line, is those whose mothers graduated from college. Now you are seeing a pretty different looking results for black students on reading, and that is for two reasons. One is that unfortunately the rates of advanced achievement for black students are so low in reading that that's why you're getting that like 100% mark. So that means Basically, about as many percentage-wise students whose mothers attended some college are earning the advanced score on the reading NAEP compared to those whose mothers completed college. Um, so that's why that is so high, um, because that total number is maybe like one or two percent. It's still overall pretty low. And then you're seeing some zeros down here. That does not mean that zero black students in those socioeconomic groups are in the advanced um, but unfortunately, the NAEP data explorer, it rounds to the nearest whole number. And so it means it was still a very, very low percentage that ended up rounding down to zero. But it's not, it's not a real zero. Go with me. That was a lot. Um, the last group um, of findings is about how these excellence gaps have changed over time. So we took a look back, going back to 2003. And we had two major findings. The good news is that for almost all of these racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups, the rate of advanced achievement has at least been consistent, if not improved, over time. And then this is particularly true for Asian American and Pacific Islander students. The less good, although perhaps not surprising news, um, is that after the pandemic, we saw declining rates of advanced achievement for all groups. Um, and the one like, piece of editorializing I would throw in about this is, although this might seem obvious, I think it's important to keep in mind because I think a lot of folks are very focused on remediation and helping students who are struggling to make it even to that proficient level in the aftermath of the pandemic. And obviously that is extremely important, but we also shouldn't assume that our like, highest achieving and highest potential students are gonna be just fine because obviously they are not, right, in any of these groups. Um, so a couple things here, these results are for reading. You can see over time from this line is 2000, going up to 2022. Um, again, you can see generally increasing rates of advanced achievement. You can also see growing excellence gaps over time. Um, one thing that I will flag is that, because it might come up in the questions later, um, is that if we look here about 20 years ago, the students in the lowest SES group, um, pretty much everyone is achieving at the same very low um, rate of advanced achievement. So I'll just top that away for a little bit later. Um, and then another thing I want to know that I'm remembering to note is this is from zero to 25. That's the scale for this image. So keep in mind when I go to map because the scale here is zero to 50. Uh, so I don't want to be misleading about that. It's just there has just been huge growth and huge expansion of those gaps. So we want to be able to show a little more detail with the reading, but obviously we have to fit all the lines in the act for math. Um, but you overall see similar patterns, generally rising achievement, generally growing gaps, and you see an even more precipitous post-kids drop, I would say, with math. Um, and then I 
realize I ended that on kind of a grim note, so I should say, first of all, thank you for listening. Um, but also, these are not problems, like these are not like inevitable technical problems, these are not problems without solutions. Um, and so I am looking forward to our panel discussion, and thank you for bearing with me. For me. Mike, thank you for inviting me to moderate this really interesting panel on this very interesting report. Um, I'm going to introduce our other panelists, and then we're going to start off with a few questions for Meredith, and we'll, then, we'll, we'll all get into it. Um, first to my immediate right, Jonathan Plucker is a professor of education and associate dean for faculty affairs at Johns Hopkins University School of Education, immediate past president of the National Association for Gift and Children. This research examines education policy and talent development with more than 300 publications to his credit and over $40 million in external funding to support his work. I'm sure the Johns Hopkins folks appreciate like that last <laughs> <laughs> um, Allison, Allison Rose Sokol, did I pronounce that properly? This, uh, it serves as Entrust Vice President for P12 Education, where she spearheads the, their work in identifying research based solutions to education and equities and collaborating with advocates to expand excellence for students of color and students from low income backgrounds. Um, former elementary school teacher, instructional coach, and education researcher. And then Lewis Moore, superintendent of the Red Bank Regional High School District. So someone's out there actually uh, doing, doing the work rather than just thinking about the work. Red Bank Regional is widely recognized for the depth and breadth of its programs, the quality of its faculty, and the diversity and excellence of its student body. Did you write, did, did you rank that part? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I'm sure it's all true. He's also vice president of New Jersey's Superintendents Network, an organization working throughout the state to improve instructional practice and bring excellence and equity to all students. Okay, Meredith, let's start with you. Um, so I, I think the first question that came to my mind when I read the report and then was reminded of listening to your presentation just now is that clearly Asian American students are surfing above all the rest. And in fact, it was interesting when you showed the gaps between Asian American students and others, those gaps were much bigger than, say, the white black and the white Hispanic gaps. So like, we often think about this in terms of you know, in terms of these um, excellence gaps, the achievement gaps in terms of white versus black or Hispanic, but this really shows that the breadth of the Asian American um, gaps with um, all others, particularly black and Hispanic students. So what can we, what do we know about this? Like, why is that the case? And you know, what's going on? Is this a case of people, other, some people being behind, or is it a case of this one group having extraordinary achievement? above what might be expected, and, and what can we take from the experience of this community that might be able to be applied to other students and other families? Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you for the question. Um, so that's obviously a huge, huge success story. Um, and I would say a couple of things. I would say first, this is a descriptive study, so we're just saying what we see in the data. Um, for sure, there are no answers in this, in this report. Uh, there's certainly a lot of hypothesizing online, but I would find a couple of things. I would say like one thing, as I noted before, like Asian Americans are not a monolithic group, and they've certainly changed. That population has evolved a lot over the last 20 years with different patterns of immigration. And so I think the answers to that question, we'll have to take that uh, into account. And I would say one, uh, two other things, as I noted, when we took a look at those reading um, achievement rates over time. 20 years ago, there actually wasn't a big difference, at least for like the lowest SES groups. Pretty much all racial ethnic groups were achieving advanced at the same, or extremely similar rates. So when we're looking for answers to that question, we want to think about number one, first of all, what, you know, what is different for Asian American Pacific Islander students? What is, what is more accessible to those groups over time, first of all, has changed a lot in the last 20 years. So whatever these resources are, we're not as available or we're not being accessed or whatever the case may be in 2003. Um, and then additionally, what is in some way more available, more accessible to the highest SES groups, right? Because that gap is so much larger among the most advantaged students. Um, so I realize I did not answer your question, but I think that those are details that I think are important to, to keep in mind. Because, you know, there's a lot of pontification about more yeah. general theories, and, like, those are important. Those hold the answer. It's right. Right. Well, this will not be the first time a reporter asks somebody who tries to write a descriptive study to give a, a reason why. Yeah. Um, 
But let's open that question up to the others on the panel as well. For the moment, let's stick with this high levels of achievement on the part of Asian American students. Does anybody have a theory or a thought about either why this is or what we can learn from this high achievement that possibly could uh, help other students? I mean, I would just uh, briefly say I, uh, I've thought about this a lot. Um, I've been looking at, at data, uh, descriptive and otherwise, on this question since my career started. I'm not going to say how long ago that was, a long time. Um, and uh, I think it is, in large part, cultural. Um, and But I don't know what we really take away from that, other than um, it's an experience uh, to Meredith's point, we're talking about Asian Americans. There's over 100 different Asian American groups, right, with very different socioeconomic status histories, immigration patterns. Um, a, Viet, uh, a, a Vietnamese family that came over in the late 50s, late 60s, late 70s, or today are very different types of families, right? And um, so you, we, have, we have to be careful uh, there, I think. But uh, part of it is a big appreciation for opportunity. So when you're doing after-school programs, weekend programs, and things like that, um, is that for me? Okay, um, uh, but she's not there. Uh, it, um, uh, we see uh, a lot of Asian American students in those programs. Um, we know that those programs have at least a small academic benefit for students. Makes sense that they're going to start doing better too. Um, uh, we're going to get into that a lot more. Later. Okay. Maybe what, what, yeah, it is. Yeah, right. I'll, um, I mean, I would start by saying that I at least do not identify as an AAIP, AAPI person. And so it would start with probably speaking to like the people about whom the data is you know, uh, referencing. But because you asked the question, I'll say I don't think we can have any conversation about the achievement or opportunity gaps for people of color, particularly black people in this country, without talking about like 400 years of like anti-black biases and prejudices that are baked into our system because of the legacy of slavery. And so like, you know, when we think about the phrase excellence gaps, I wanna make sure we're thinking about, you know, our, our systems are far from excellent. The decisions we make about who gets resources and opportunities, those are far from excellent. The students, the like black and brown students in our classes who have big dreams and are incredibly eager to learn, like. Those children are excellent. It's the hundreds of years of deep, deep inequities that um, I, I think we have to ground our conversation. Well, let's let's pick up on that that very important point because you know really um, even though I started there, it's a lot more urgent um, to understand how to bring people up than it is to necessarily understand why this particular group or parts of this group are are already up. I mean. So we're talking, when we talk about, um, one question that comes to my mind is when we talk about advanced coursework and gifted and talented programs and all of the sort of accelerated opportunities that some students get and other students don't, they, are these, do you guys think that these high test scores are being driven by the participation in these or is there already high achievement and therefore they're going into these? It's sort of a chicken and egg situation. But what, what is driving this to start with? Because I think that if we're gonna try to unpack the systems, we have to like see like how are these systems working? Are, this, are, are kids achieving because they're given these opportunities or are the opportunities being given to kids who have already shown achievement? Do you wanna try that? Yeah, I could try that one. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll take the easy answer and say it's probably both, but, but let, me, let, me take, let me take the part that I think, or I think the, the angle that's more important. And I think the best way I could demonstrate that is our school-based success with AP and IB, and I think the fact that that tends to coincide with larger trends. And here's the point. Uh, you know, when I first started teaching, and certainly when I was in high school, AP was incredibly exclusive. I mean, very, very limited offerings, very few students taking advantage of those offerings. I'm proud that I'm in a school where over 60% of our juniors consistently tap into those programs. Um, and you know, case in point, in one of the most popular courses, which is the ELA composition class, which is highly subscribed by juniors, students are consistently scoring well into the threes, virtually no rates of academic failure in the, in the program over the past 
five years that we, that we looked at it. And I'll tell you something else that's really remarkable. If you look at where the kids come in front loaded, they are not superstars. More than half of them have PSAT scores on the, uh, on the, uh, on the literacy section of the PSAT. That would suggest these are not kids that are going to thrive in the AP program, and yet they do. And I think one of the things that my team and I have spent a lot of time thinking about is what's coming together in these courses that's producing these outcomes. And I think what you know, we've really kind of leaned into this. It's clear content. There's clear goals that are monitored by an external authority, right? In other words, it's not a local based honors course. And finally, there's robust support for teachers, right? And if, you, and if you put all those things together, you get a really strong, I think, way that even at the high school level, to Michael's point, we can make a difference, right? Now, we've got to get more kids confident and, um, and willing to take the risk, which I think is a cultural issue in high school. And I think we have to do a very good year in the first and second year, especially in high school, to really build the strong foundation for it. Now, so, don't want to dominate, but yeah. I think that, that, that's, my, that's my take. It's, it's uh, to be sure the kids have got to want to go into the program, right? And that, that's important, right? And that requires building from maybe in the early grades and maybe certainly in the early years of high school. But once they're there, it's a good system, right? So I'm going to come back a little more to some details about what's happening near school in, in a little bit, but I want to keep it on the on the um, general level for just a, a few more beats. Um, Mike, in his introduction, talked about the this question of detracking and what and, and suggested he said, ex, "Don't mend it, don't end it, extend it, don't end it," which was obviously an argument against what some places are doing, which is trying to have more mixed ability classes. Um, you know, some would argue that, especially at the younger ages, it's better to ex to have mixed ability classes so that you are essentially getting rid of the gatekeeping altogether, give everybody this opportunity to have um, enriched um, coursework, and then that will set up more kids for success later on. And then the other argument is that no, that we just need to continue having it, you know, separate enriched. Um, classes, but try to get more, do a better job identifying who should be in there. And I wonder if you could each maybe take a crack at like which what which of those two roughly stated philosophies do you think has the better of the argument? I'll look at me. Um, uh, I'll try it first. Um, uh, well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Actually, I, I really don't, and I think. I think like, we are starting to see school districts around the country that are taking that latter approach, just opening the door, saying anyone can take advance, or even making the default curriculum and say math the advanced curriculum. Enrolling everybody in Everybody. That. I mean, I think I'm the sorry. argument being oh, that we have it, we failed to get the four kids in, so let's try something different. Let's right. open right. the door. Um, and I, 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 I like that approach for for several reasons. One being in this country, we've decided to really highly ration advanced opportunities. Uh, we, we have made them incredibly rare. And so there's this artificial scarcity that, that leads to lots of these problems that we're talking about. Um, so just opening the doors, um, that's a radical way to deal with scarcity, right? Anyone can do it. What we find is that, I mean, huge percentages of students start to thrive. So I think in general, our sort of default curriculum has ratcheted down expectations so massively. So I, I, think, I think it's great to open it up. At the same time, we have to be honest with ourselves that even when we do that, there are students who, yes, are gonna to start to thrive, but there are students who are, who are heading into that opportunity who almost certainly already know everything that's gonna be taught in that year those students still deserve to be challenged every single day in school too. So what do we do for those students? Um, if we can find ways to have interventions where we can actually differentiate for those students while opening it up to everybody else. Like it's the same classroom differentiating. Yes, exactly. That, that to me is the fuzzy blue unicorn. I, I, that would be awesome. I wish everyone had that unicorn. Um, we don't seem to be able to pull that off yet. Uh, we can we can differentiate fairly narrowly, a couple grade levels, 
doing it beyond that, uh, it's just very, very hard. I think I think is why we, we just don't we don't seem to be able to pull it off. So I think there's always going to be a need um, for those students who are four or five grade levels ahead. Those students are out there. Um, some of our work suggests like almost every class in the country has at least one or two of those students. Um, what are we doing for those students as we bring sort of the minimum expectations up for everybody else? Uh, to me, it's kind of a walk and chew gum at the same time thing. We can do this, but it, it is going to take some rethinking about what the default curriculum is and then what advanced means on top of that. There, there will always be advanced students. Um, how do we meet their needs while also acknowledging that we have been really undershooting the vast majority of kids in school? Yeah, I mean, there's a big difference between whether you're defining the people you need something special for as one or two kids or 60%. Yeah, yeah that's very, yeah, very well, different. Those are, very, very different. Well, what's your thought? Uh, well, you said that so well, and I agree with so much of it, that we need both the raising of expectations and rigor and relevance in all of the classes. And I think the one thing I'll add, so as not to repeat what you said, is we, of course, have to be meeting the needs of students' skills and abilities, but I don't want to lose sight of interest. Like, my sister is a, an engineer at NASA, and she was in high school. She craved AP science courses. I did not. And that's okay. And I think particularly as students get, get older, we need ways not just to look at their test scores and not just to look at their GPA, but to hear their voices about what they're interested in, what their dreams are, what their ambitions are, because there is really solid research. And our partners actually at Equal Opportunity Schools have this really amazing way of hearing from students what, what they want to accomplish and what their post-secondary hopes and dreams are, and we need ways to tap into that because the research shows that that, that willingness, that desire, that interest in whatever it is, AP science or AP literature, like that matters and is a huge motivating factor for students. And so yes, and, and that interest piece is really important. And, and as long as, I'm going to direct this at you, as, as long as we do still have some advanced classes, whether that's fifth grade enrichment or AP in high school, and we're trying to open the door to more students to take advantage of those. What have you found are the like bread and butter, like actual on the ground techniques that work to get a greater, um, a, a broader set of students into that, into that work, into well, those courses? Well, Jonathan's work has been very helpful to us and the work is very hard. It's very difficult. And on the front lines where we are, we're proud of the work and we're proud of what's going on, but it is hard work, I'll just say it at the front end. But I think, I just want to comment on I'll, I'll take something that I think John said has a lot of application in high schools. And that's, that's the capacity to, to differentiate instruction, not only for students who are struggling, but also for students that are high achievers. Curiously, some of the best people, some of the best, some of the most talented instruction or some of the most talented teachers using differentiated instruction techniques are quote AP teachers or IB teachers because they're working. I mentioned that ELA model I just or they're working with a wide range of learners. And, and I think that's contributed to the fact that AP hasn't lost credibility with high achieving students and their families. And I'll apply, when I say AP, that's a proxy for IB and dual and well programs too. I'll, I'll, I'll say something else that's important too. I think at least where I said, you have to be deliberate and careful how you do this. In ELA, we have adopted it all in strategy, but we're doing it in a nuanced way. Certain kids can start to access college level courses in their sophomore year. Certain kids won't access those courses till they're seniors. It depends when they're ready for it. So we're, we're trying to resequence the way we offer courses so it's not rigidly aligned with grade level, but by the ability level of the students, right? And then, you know, um, so all those things are kind of percolating around. Um, so I think you have to be mindful. And the third thing is, you know, not all disciplines are going to part, but you can't apply the same strategy to all disciplines. I mean, certainly with math, Student arrives at high school thinking algebra two in ninth grade. We probably keep that kid accelerating. That kid's going to probably wind up with multivariate calculus. That's not going to be our all-in course, right? In math, but in subjects like language arts, it does make sense, I think, to have an all-in strategy with, as I say, multiple entrance points, right? All-in meaning all students in the same meaning, class, or what do you mean by no? That? Meaning what we what by all-in? Good point. All-in to us means all students will participate in one of our six ELA courses by the time they graduate. Some will take six. Some will, I'm, I mean, so, six, I'm so sorry. Good classes. Oh, yeah, in other words, so, some will take three, I should say. There's six that are offered. Some will take three because they started in their sophomore year. 
Some will take two because they've started in the junior year, and some will take one. You know, it, it kind of depends there. But that all-in strategy is so important because it promotes a building culture that says that we are striving for everyone's success, we're encouraging everybody, and everybody has a responsibility to build this success starting with ninth grade. If not, you wind up, especially in the high school setting, you wind up with kids that have advocates, kids that know the system, are gonna plug into these courses, and kids that might not have those, uh, those benefits are going to see themselves as, I don't belong in those programs, which is academic toxin. It, it, in a diverse high school setting where I work, that is an academic toxin, to have an environment where kids say, those programs aren't for me. And that's why we have to be, again, careful of how we, you know, how we, what are we doing deliberately to build school culture, as well as focus on instructional practice and do the other things. I'll say one last thing, and then I'll back off. What you, what you said about race and segregation is so right. I mean, I'll give, I'll give, I'll of the three setting districts that enter my school, two are affluent with virtually nobody on free and reduced lunch lines. One is 80% free and reduced. Right, and 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 I'll say this, and it's probably going to get me in trouble with the folks back home in New Jersey. But why aren't we doing more to integrate schools so the burden of caring for children who are dealing with severe needs is shared equitably by systems? Right? Why do we concentrate kids with the deepest needs in schools that are often under resourced? Right? And then say, why aren't these kids succeeding the way us to some other backgrounds are? So. Has your district ever considered redrawing the entire Yeah, we've considered policies? it. Yeah, I'll just <laughs> leave it there. <laughs> um, I guess it was, yeah, I'm sure it was very popular with, with <laughs> all of those families. Um, uh, can I, can I, can I yeah. ask the queen? You're, yes. you're, you started with a, a fairly broad question, um, really interesting where it's gone. But uh, I, we, we do have strategies on the identification side. If, we, if you are going to screen students, then um, we've learned so much about. And the two that I think are the most promising that are fairly low-hanging fruit, the first is uh, screening universally. If you're gonna test, test everybody. If you're gonna screen, screen every single student. Um, if you're not doing that, you are automatically putting bias into the system because someone's gonna be making a very subjective judgment. All judgments are subjective, I get that. Some are a lot more subjective than others. And so if you're, say, using teacher nominations or parent nominations, um, uh, uh, teacher implicit bias is real. We all experience implicit bias. Um, uh, uh, sort of the detrimental effects of not having social capital when it comes to things like parent nominations are huge. Um, you don't need to use those steps. Just test everybody. Screen everybody. It's amazing how many, especially... Uh, how many more low-income students you find. So, the, so these are students who are already performing at those levels, who are never given the opportunities because no one knows to get them to that next stage. And then the second piece is, even when you do that, we have lots of studies that students don't get the opportunities even if they have been found. And so that's why I think what uh, North Carolina has been doing, Texas is just starting next year, or sorry, this year, I'm sorry, um, automatic enrollment. Washington. Uh, and Washington, too. And a very small group of states. Um, to me, this is such common sense. Uh, but the way that North Carolina does it, um, uh, starting in uh, third grade, at your end of year math assessment, if you perform at the highest level, you're automatically placed in the most rigorous math class the following year. And whenever I describe that, the first response I get from people is, isn't, isn't that how we do it now? And it's like, no, it's not. Actually. Let me ask you a follow-up question to that system, because that, that seems sound in space make a lot of sense. What would you do, you're running, you're, you're running a middle school where they're placing kids in math in the sixth grade, and you, you give everybody the test, and you place people in their grades. And so what do you tell the parent who calls you up and says, I know that little Johnny just missed the cutoff, but I really think he can do it. And you know, we're going to support him. Let's can, can we can we give him a try? Let's put him in in the higher level. What do you tell us? Uh, in a forward-looking district, the superintendents and principals would say, "Let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. Let's see." Mm -hmm. um, uh, we don't have a lot of evidence that that's normally what happens. It's normally, well, we only have so many spots. But isn't it also sometimes what does happen because the parents who have the um, uh, 
agency and the education and the maybe just the straight up like moxie to call up the, the principal and make the request are going to be the high SES parents. Right, I can give and you a they, they, yes, So therefore they, <laughs> you know, and then those are the kids who get in. So that then further segregates the classes because the all, you know, not all, but the large numbers of say the white kids are, and maybe even the Asian kids are being moved into the higher level. And so then that's just making that sense of belonging that you refer to that even worse because you're, you're, you're kept, the, the, the classes have the stratification that is, that starts with the screener, but then is exacerbated by the parent request. I mean, the only reason my daughter got into advanced high school, I got into advanced math and late in elementary school through middle schools, because I went into the office every time and said, how come you didn't put her into the advanced math class? And I wouldn't leave the office until they put her in there. Right. When how many how many low income black parents are gonna do I, that? And every time I came home furious and said, why did I have to do that? How many families wouldn't even know that they can go into the office to make that request, right? So, so I, I, should I think the system accommodate problem. that? Should the system accommodate us allowing parents like you, or even parents like me? <clears throat> I'll put, I, you know, I might be this. I might, might do, I might have done the same thing. Do should the system accommodate those parents who are going to go and make those requests when it's going to create a? We know it's going to create a more segregated system. Can I flip the question? Sure. So, I mean, rather than asking about accommodation, which is definitely coming at it from like a, the scarcity mindset, um, I really love the bill that passed in New York last year, which is acknowledging that like we have to empower all parents with information about what courses are available and how do you, uh, you know, what's the process for getting into it and what are the benefits of those courses? I have this moment that's like burned in my brain of talking to a parent who was watching a presentation from Ed Trust about advanced coursework access. It pulls up on her computer this random email she got from her eighth grade son's school. <clears throat> and it just says, check a box, eighth grade algebra one or no. And she's sitting there in real time hearing from us about that being such a gatekeeper. And like, it's going to open or close doors to her son's entire math trajectory in high school, potentially. And we have got to give parents, all parents, so much more information about these courses how they're available, why they matter, how what supports are available. And so New York passed this bill requiring all districts to do a much better job of um, just communicating. It's like the communication piece. Right. And uh, I'm sure you can speak to that uh, on, on the ground, but it is so important. So how, how do we get at the, I think that the, this idea of belonging, I think is really important. I mean, not, not to give a second hug from my book, but this is as I was, but in my book, dream down, um, as I was working on it, that was a theme that kept coming up, this idea of belonging, which is hard to, you know, create a program to make people feel like they belong. But that is, it is an important thing in terms of whether somebody walks into a classroom and feels like this is a space for them, or whether they walk in and they feel like, actually it's not, and I mean, I'll just, like a quick anecdote, a uh, young woman I, um, was watching an honors um, uh, 11th grade uh, English class, super bright, young black woman in this class, and just really impressed by everything she said. And I asked her afterwards, do you consider AP? And she said, well, I was actually in AP for a day, and I, but I walked in and it just didn't feel like, I didn't see very many people who looked like we, didn't feel like it was really a place for me. I talked to my counselor and she said I could go down to honors, and that's what happened. So that is like, a, that speaks to belonging. And I'm wondering if any of you could talk about what can schools do to foster a sense of belonging where yeah. to counter that soon. Jump into the, sure. oh, I, I think I've got, to, I've got to give so much credit to my staff. Um, I have a wonderful letter that uh, I will read to you, but I brought it down just to kind of refresh my mind on the way down. She used that word belonging. You made my, this is a child who had never taken an accelerated course. Junior year made the jump. I'd like to think that all the work we're doing, like Jonathan said, around identification, building a culture of, of of encouragement and inclusiveness. But again, it's on the ground level of the teachers. And what she said was that it's teacher practice that's so essential. And you know, Jonathan uses a phrase that I that certainly has connected to me, and that is, "Don't be gatekeepers, be talent scouts." And I think that's got to kind of push into the way you also deliver your instruction, right? Um, I'm a former AP teacher myself, and I'm proud that I, I think later on in my teaching career, that became my attitude. But I think that's an attitude that we have to support teachers in embracing. I think we have to give them the skills 
to deal with culturally diverse populations. And I think we've got to be mindful of constantly looking at our curriculum. Is it relevant to use your work, right? And um, you know, one of the things we're going ahead with in our school is we're, we're, we're framing a district equity policy that will have the same finding and enduring role that all the other school policies that we have. That will force us, force me, and force, you know, force our Board of Ed to be mindful of this stuff, right? To do curriculum audits with, with equity in mind. Equity and, ad, and excellence, because I pair the two. I hope that's a, is that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, we could talk all day about that. Um, uh, I had plenty more questions here, but I, and I have some from the audience that were submitted in advance, but um, why don't we give uh, uh, folks who are here in the room, if you have any questions, give you a, have an uh, opportunity to ask them. Yes. Go ahead, just speak loud. That early on graph which showed uh, income versus achievement, high achievement. Um, <laughs> the salary flag, that people with more money than can be in private schools or at tutors compared to the rest of the system. But these are all public school data, right? No, no. this is national this is data. So yes, in part, it may well reflect private school enrollment, it may well reflect tutoring, and all sorts of other resources. Also thinking about kids whose mothers completed college, they're also kids who've had the family resources that their parents, and to Jonathan's point, like knew to get them, how to get them into those advanced classes, parents who were able to help them with their homework at night, like all of these, all of these factors. And you know, in the New York Times article that Mike mentioned as well, as he tells a lot of these factors. But yeah, absolutely reflective of all of that. Other questions in the room? Hey, although, oh, yeah. although, I mean, yes, I certainly agree with everything, Meredith. And um, it doesn't, like, why do those benefits not seem to benefit black and Hispanic students, Native American students, as much as they do other groups? Part of it is sort of the legacies of discrimination bias, as you mentioned earlier. But I think, I think, I think that's a really important part of this conversation. Um, is, it, is it just access to opportunity? But, but, you know, again, it was a descriptive study, right? So, but no, no, no. I think these are really important questions. But thank you for mentioning that and also reminds me to reiterate and why has that changed so much over time, right? Like, why was it that when I was in high school 20 years ago, the fact that my mother went to college was less advantageous to me than perhaps it would be if I were in high school right now? You know what yeah. I mean? Like, why have those advantages grown over time with socioeconomic status? A question I also had, I wonder if that group college graduate, it seems like they're from an income point of view, there, that could be a big span of, I mean, and do you think there might be any, it would look any different if you could have it more gradations of <clears throat> income? It certainly could. I would say we also ran the study using estimated number of books and mm -hmm. home as a proxy for SES, as well as free and reduced price lunch, and we had pretty similar Results like free and reduced price lunch is the more typical right. um, variable, but that doesn't is either yes yeah, or no. And then we wanted to be able to show all those shades of gray yeah. in between. Um, but it was pretty similar results, which honestly I found surprising as well. Yeah. Did the studies separate out urban, jungly AFT, then suburban and? Oh, that is so interesting. It's in knots. Um, but that is a great question. Mm -hmm. why, why do you ask, do you, why do, I mean, suburban and urban have a lot of differences beyond what teachers union represents them. So why do you, why didn't cast it like that? Well, if you look at ALT, um, in my study of various districts, there's a culture of truly low expectations. And if you look at the AFT itself, it's dictating. We're going to do we there forever. Our, in Rochester, um, our union chief has been there for the three years. Okay, all right, that's it. Um, other, let's take one more question from the room. If there is one, I'll, um, well, I'll ask I don't know question, and I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's about kid, uh, uh, minority kids taking tests, feeling pressure that their voice that they're the and they do worse on the tests when they feel like it's a high stakes test. I'm sorry for that. Stereotype. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Stereotype threat. It, could that reflect why uh, black and Latino students score lower than other students? Is it? Well, yeah. I'm sorry. I want to repeat the question. That there's the fact that the test feels 
high stakes the, and there is pressure. A, there is a research saying which might co co a correctly identified is called stereotype <laughs> threat, where when kids, and it happens with women and girls too, when you're told this is a high stakes test, it's going to show your intelligence, that black and Latino kids and women, it, that freaks them out somehow, and they tend to score lower. And so, I can respond to that. Yeah, it's the idea that if you are in a some marginalized group, you might have like a fear in a high stakes situation that you are going to confirm the worst negative stereotypes yep. of your group. So, for example, you described it better than I did. Well, only because I looked it up earlier because I might have thought about mentioning it in my presentation. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, for example, girls taking like math tests and in particular, um, and you know, black students, um, I believe, for math as well. Um, and yeah, that absolutely could play a role, but then that's still, for me, I still have the question of why has there been that change over 20 years and why does socioeconomic status affect it to the extent that and it we, seems to. And we do see these excellent gaps as measured by grades and course enrollment and other measures too. So it's not just the taking of this one test that would show. Is, yeah, sure. And it could be for other assessments that, for example, would get you into the advanced course that ultimately recruits your learning. Yeah. But yeah, but it's a clear rule. I mean, it's, it's such a great question. And, you know, standard tests have a very important role, but they aren't a perfect tool, as all tools are. And I feel like it just speaks to that idea that, like, it should be a ceiling, not a floor. Like, if a student is doing really well in the test, the fact that they're not automatically a middle tier in white is, is saying that we should add crazy, we should absolutely be giving them access. But also, it, that should be the bare minimum. If students are demonstrating readiness and eagerness in other ways, because this test, these tests are in no way like per perfectly able to capture all the students' brilliance, that we should be opening the door to others. To that point, and this is something that always kind of cracks me up. We we we, we do tend to sort of mythologize tests, right? Um, yeah, they absolutely have their you know uses. Um, but I, I will be in districts and they'll be talking about, they'll be like, oh, we found this low income student who like learned to create their own app on like the phone and they did this amazing thing, but we tested them and they didn't test what, and I was like, no, 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 no. The <laughs> test is the indicator of the behavior that you've already seen. Yeah, right. You don't need to give them the test. They're already doing it. Like the test is, is that, a false Is that the normal, like if we, I mean, I realize there are, you know, thousands of school districts throughout the country, so we, it's hard to just typify. But would you say that the standard in most places is in gatekeeper, you have to have get a certain score to be in an advanced or in a brief class? I, I think that's, uh, I could have put a percentage on it, but generally that's the way that people tend to go. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna ask a question that was um, offered ahead of the event. Um, a couple of, can we go, go to 530? Yeah, okay. Um, what are some of the reasons why attempts at education reform have not successfully addressed the excellence of gaps for underrepresented students and report, repeatedly report that they do not feel challenged or engaged in their schooling? So what are some uh, education reform efforts that didn't work? And anybody wants to? I can talk about an education reform that I don't think has happened that would be beneficial. Well, does uh, anyone have one that was tried okay. and didn't work before we in default to uh, changing the question to? I'm going to give a, a non-answer answer, which is I think like uh, it is very important when we're thinking about education reform. You know, this conversation has been primarily about advanced course thinking, which is very important, but it doesn't exist in a vacuum. And when we think about giving students resources, there's like so many dimensions of resource equity that we need to be tackling all at once. Uh, not that's fine. Not all at the same time, but at some point, and to be tackled, you know, funding inequities, ensuring that all students have access to strong teachers and ideally a diverse workforce that reflects. The de demographics of the students, a rigorous and relevant um, coursework, facilities in which they are safe and supporting access to technology. I'll stop the list now, but I think it's very important when we think about education reform that we don't look for some magic silver bullet, but that we're thinking holistically about all of the ways that students experience the dollars that buy resources and are thinking about how to make those equitable. To quote you quoting us, um, giving more to those who need it the most. <laughs> 
Uh, and why did you offer your your thought? Were you sure? sure if you tried? Yes, because <laughs> I read this. I, I I cruelly cut you off. So please. No, that's fair. Um, I was at least the second time I changed your question today. <laughs> um, but just thinking, and just is thinking about some comments that were made earlier too about like differentiation about what can be done in the classroom. Just like a much more teacher support. Like I was also a classroom teacher for seven years, six years. Um, and thinking about like within the same classroom, like we talked a lot about differentiation in my teacher training program. Zero percent of it was dedicated to thinking about differentiation for more advanced students. Like so they mentioned like that middle that, and down, not middle. And exactly. Down. Like they mentioned, oh, you could differentiate for more advanced students too, but there was no discussion of like what that should look like. I think that's pretty common. Yeah. Um, so in that regard, and then thinking too about like when we do expands like these advanced programs which i absolutely agree with what others have said on now like expand access to these programs it doesn't need to be a limited resource but thinking about how we can support teachers and maintaining the level of rigor of those courses in my own teaching experience i have taught advanced courses and settings where they were open to all students um without particular criteria for enrollment which i see no issue with however the curriculum curricula i should say in that school were like broadly like a little bit done down like they weren't maintaining that high level of rigor the idea was much more like oh we've got to include all of these students now rather than hey we should raise the bar to ask all of these students to meet this level of challenge and it's hard as a teacher right to be able to do that when that's not the department or the school culture right and so supporting teachers and being able to do that i think is well, huge. Just I mean, this it, but that and that and that exact point makes me makes me think, Meredith, about your book. You know, the things that you found in uh, Shaker Heights is that um, I, uh, I I would consider mixed ability classroom differentiation to be a pretty big failure at this point. Turns out it's really hard. You mean in Shaker or in general? And, and everywhere. Uh -huh. um, but that's kind of how I read what you were finding is they were like, oh, this makes perfect sense. And then they started trying things, detracking, and it turns out it's really, really hard. Like you, a lot of supports have to be in place. I think we've really skipped over the part of the conversation where we're having a pre-differentiated prescriptive curriculum greatly helps differentiate in both in both directions. Um, but I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you found at Shaker Heights and how they, and where you think they're gonna go next with detracking and differentiating across these wide readiness levels. Yeah, so for the, um, th thanks for the question. I, that was not a, not a setup, but um, the, uh, so Shaker Heights, for those who might not know, is a suburb of Cleveland and it's racially diverse and economically diverse. And with you know all the problems that we see historically all, all over the place in terms of um, um, gaps, no matter how you measure it. Um, and in 2020, they moved to a fairly um, significant detracking delatteling um, and hence from basically fifth into early high school. So they still have AP and IB and dual enrollment courses, so those are maintained, but they have mixed ability classes, essentially, on your way to that. Um, I mean, my, um, my assessment was that if the way they had it was such an aggressive level of leveling, you know, starting so young, you know, in fifth grade, you're essentially, you know, telling, ten, decided for 10 year olds whether, you know, you're going to be on the advanced track or the non advanced track, and theoretically you can switch back and forth, but in reality that just doesn't happen, especially in math. But even in PLA, it doesn't seem to really happen. And, and part of that is, I think, the messaging that goes with it like, those are the smart kids, and, and these are the non smart kids, and that's heavily racialized. So it's, you know, even more damaging um, for kids of color, I think, when you, when you have a system like that. So it did, did, did seem like it needed a, a significant intervention, especially in those younger grades. I mean, putting aside the wisdom of doing this in the middle of the pandemic, which I think there were a lot of reasons why that was not a great idea. I mean, the argument for it was essentially politically, it was easier to do when you didn't have a bunch of people complaining about it. Uh, you, know, you rip the bandaid off and you move on. But I think from a practical point of view, it was like, had a lot of problems. Um, but we're now three years in and they're committed and they're moving forward. And I think that it, um, 
it, it's it's harder to do because it's really hard to do. I have seen it, like observed some really good teachers doing some really excellent differentiation. Um, you know, three worksheets, there's the high, middle, and low, choose the one that feels right for you today, that kind of a thing. Um, I've seen students essentially having positive impacts on one another, like a higher level student just in subtle ways, um, you know, one example, I mean, these are, these are this is anecdotal, but you know, one example was in a math class, I think this was a seventh grade math class, there was one student just sort of staring, they were just to write down on a piece of paper, all the things that they had um, cut, learned, all the topics they covered in that unit. And there was this one girl, she is writing just like curiously, like so many things on this paper. And this boy next to her is just kind of staring out the window. And she looks over at him and says, um, wow, you ever written anything? And then all of a sudden he starts writing things down. Now that was like a negative example, but it was it, being in this atmosphere where he was next to this person did end up Perfect. pulling him up. And in, in a more positive way, I saw in a different class two, two girls in this case, one of whom was there working on a worksheet, one had finished it, and she was sort of explaining it to the other person. How did, oh, here's how you do it. Just very patiently going through, explaining how this this particular problem was done. And I asked this higher cheating girl, you know, if she enjoyed doing that. And she said, she literally said to me, this um, seventh grader, yeah, when you explain it to someone else, it gets it in your own head better. Mm. And so I did, I, I do think there's potential for it, but I think it's hard. I do think it's hard to do. And it's really important that the highest achieving kids also feel like they're being served and that their kids are being challenged and that they're not just sort of being, you'll be fine, don't worry about it. Which I think is a risk, you know, um, in this whole area. So, and keeping every, it's also really important to kind of keep everybody in the boat or you don't have a diverse school district anymore. So, um, but they seem, they're committed. I mean, they say, at least for now, so they're, they're, they're moving like forward, they're, they're sticking with it. Um, and, um, you know, they just, in fact, just now they're doing a series of public events to discuss it and like go through it and answer questions which they I think would admit themselves should have been done is overdue but they're actually now engaging with the community around it so we'll but I don't know I think it's too like soon. a sequel for your book in a few years too, yeah. too soon I, I don't know if the public is crying out for a sequel but uh, <laughs> anyway all right well we're at 5 30 so um uh thank you for the question thank you all for your wonderful answers we can give the, give the panel a yeah, it comes out. And if you think you only scratch the surface of these really important issues, but hopefully this all gave us all something to think about and um, hope we'll all read yeah, this very interesting report if we haven't already and you know continue the conversation on these really crucial questions. So thank you. Thank you.